Good morning, church family. Welcome to worship. We're so thankful that we're able to join together and have this moment uh, here together. And uh, this is not the environment we hoped to be in this morning. We were planning on being together in person, as you know, but that's just not been possible. But that's okay, because this morning we close out the Advent series, and the Advent time is just an opportunity to celebrate all that came about because Jesus came, God with us, Emmanuel. And as we celebrate Advent, you know, the concepts that we uh, rejoice in are true and real and powerful no matter where we are or what we're doing. So the fact that we're able to still meet together online um, just, t- just teaches us that we truly have an opportunity to celebrate this morning, even remotely. Let me begin the service today with uh, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, as we celebrate the Messiah, Jesus. This is what was prophesied. It said, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom. To establish it and to uphold it with justice, with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Friends, as we prepare to worship and to study God's word together this morning, let's go before him in prayer, if you'd bow with me. Father, we just come humbly before your throne today, and we thank you for all that we celebrate, all that we rejoice in. Father, it all points to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, God in the flesh, perfect representation of the Father. God, as you came, you brought hope, you brought love, you brought joy, and you brought peace. And we're so thankful, we're so grateful. God, we praise you today. We just pray you bless this time, pray that you would be glorified. We pray as we study your word that you would teach us and comfort us and equip us, guide us and direct us. We love you, Lord, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, let's worship together this morning. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence? that our souls to him belong who holds our days within his hand what comes apart from his command and what will keep us to the end the love of christ in which we stand Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. What truth can calm the troubled soul? But God is good, God is good. Where is His grace and goodness known? In our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above the stormy trial who sends the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore the rock of Christ oh sing hallelujah our hope springs eternal oh sing confess Christ our hope in life and death unto the grave what shall we sing Christ he lives Christ he lives and what reward will heaven 
heaven bring everlasting life with him there we will rise to meet the lord then sin and death will be destroyed and we will feast in endless joy when christ is ours forevermore oh sing hallelujah our hope springs eternal oh sing hallelujah now and ever we confess christ our hope in life and death our hope in life and death now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death
He who was before there was light Walked across the pages of time He who made every living thing Behold Him He who heard humanity's cry Left His throne to wake as a child Came like the least of us. Behold him, Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the Roaring Lion. Oh, be still. Behold. Today, friends, we close out our Advent series, and the fourth concept that we're going to discover and celebrate today is that of peace, the arrival of peace. True, everlasting peace has come about because Jesus the Messiah has been born. So what do we know about peace? Just think for a moment what peace means to you. 
You know, often we think of peace as being the absence of conflict or the absence of war or the absence of difficulty. And as we study the Word of God, we understand that that that's really not accurate. In fact, maybe the opposite is more accurate, that peace actually comes about when there's much turmoil on the outside, right? Peace is not the absence of problems. It's the God-given divine characteristic of being completely certain and at rest even in the midst of difficulty. There's an amazing story throughout history that that I've read, and you may have read too, but it's it's just this beautiful picture of how peace can come about even in the midst of difficult circumstances. It took place in World War I, December of 1914. Uh, World War I was a horrible time, right? A lot of fighting, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of difficulty, but there's this beautiful, this episode, this thing that took place on the battlefield between German and British soldiers, December 1914, Christmas Eve, one of the troops began singing a Christmas carol uh, from, you know, the, the kind of the dugout that he was in, in the middle of the, the battle. Uh, there's this no man's land between the two armies, and on either side are, you know, opposing forces, and it's Christmas Eve, and a troop starts singing Christmas carols. Before long, several other troops began, you know, joining in, and And the entire army is singing. And what they notice, uh, you know, despite the war they're in, they realize that the other army across the no man's land, across the battleground, is singing too. Now, the lyrics are different because there's different languages, but the tune is the same. And this beautiful uh, kind of environment just continues to grow. There's more songs. There's more, you know, louder and louder and more joy and more passion as these two opposing armies start singing Christmas carols together from other sides of the battlefield. It even escalates into the point to where uh, they put down their, their weapons and they start exchanging gifts out in the middle of the no man's land. They said it called a ceasefire and they start taking gifts out of their commodities that they have. Obviously, they you know, didn't have the ability to have really nice gifts. I mean, they're in the middle of the trenches in a war, but they started taking some of their possessions and exchanging them across the battlefield. It even triumphed them to early on Christmas morning the next day, they had a soccer match, we're told, between two opposing armies, uh, had a fun-filled moment just to celebrate Christmas in the middle of a war. Now, obviously, some of the high-ranking officers found out about it and were not happy and ensure that that would never happen again ever in battle. But for a brief moment, there was a ceasefire. There was a time across an ugly battlefield that had been full of death and, and you know, just horrible circumstances where there was this beautiful glimmer of peace. It's an amazing story. really shows that there's much more going on in us than what we can do or experience. There is God-given ability to know real peace. That's where we come to when we come to the Christmas story. We all go through battles and difficulties and circumstances. And those things we don't like to go through, those things we don't look forward to, but none of them can rob us of our peace if we know what peace really is. And so we see in Scripture couple of characteristics about peace that are similar to the story of the battlefield of 1914. Long before the World War I took place, there were other wars going on. There were other enemies at play. There were other circumstances that caused people to have a lack of peace. But in the midst, God's divine plan brings peace. So let's look together. The first thing we see is that peace is extraordinary. Peace doesn't come by human terms doesn't come because we've lined up our situations and our circumstances in a particular way. Peace comes only by the divine provision of God. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. We read this passage last week. I want to read it again this morning and say something else that we see in this scripture in addition to what we saw last week. So read with me, Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. The angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. 
And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom his he is pleased. So we see this beautiful picture of the shepherds out in the field. We see you know, the angels appearing and, and delivering the most wonderful news of all that the Savior has been born. But there's a particular instance here, a detail about this story that really stands out about how it's God's divine provision. See, the shepherds were told that this baby would be wrapped in swaddling clothes. And that's an illustration they would understand. We talked about this for a moment last week, but let me remind us again. The shepherds, while it was not a desirable profession, it was an important one. Because prior to the Messiah coming, we know there was this system of of sacrifices that had to be made in the temple in order for sin to be atoned for. And these shepherds specifically would have been trained in picking out the spotless lambs for the sacrifice, because the lambs to be sacrificed could not have a blemish. And so the, as a new lamb was born, it was tradition and custom for the shepherds to wrap the lamb in strips of cloth so that its skin or its fur, you know, its, its, its coat would not be uh, stuck with burrs, it would not be damaged, it would not be nicked, it would not be, you know, in any way blemished. And so the shepherds were in the regular habit of picking out the most beautiful baby lambs, with, without spot or blemish, and in order to protect them and to maintain uh, you know, the purity of them, they would wrap them in swaddling cloths, just like the baby Messiah, Jesus Christ, was to be wrapped. And so it's beautiful to see the sign that God gave them that, hey, not only is this baby born, not only is this child the Messiah, Christ the Lord, but I'm going to give you a sign that he is the ultimate sacrifice, the Lamb of God, once and for all, to atone for the sin of mankind. I'm going to show you if the same way you wrap the beautiful baby lambs is the same way the Lamb of God is going to be shown to you as you go and look. And so it's just amazing that, that peace is extraordinary. Peace comes about in ways that are so divine, that are so miraculous, that it just couldn't come from anywhere other than God. I would argue this morning, I would, I would suppose that, to explain that peace, if it's not from God, it's not real peace. But peace that is real comes from God through his divine provision, through his plan, through his protection, through his miraculous power. So we celebrate that today, that we have peace with God. Number two, we see that peace is perfect. Peace doesn't change, you know, with with the shifting winds. Peace doesn't come and go. Peace, when it's from God, when it's extraordinary, when it's divinely provided, it's perfect. It stands the test of time. It stands the test of trial. It stands the test of circumstances. This is what we see back in Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. This is the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the time of rules and rituals and, and the legalistic requirements and the things that are going on. But here we see a promise that peace will surpass even the Old Covenant, it will surpass even the things of old, even the things that were taught, even the things that were accomplished. Peace is deeper even than any of our uh, religious requirements. And it says this in, in verse 24, excuse me, uh, verse 20, yeah, 24 and 26, through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace peace. This beautiful passage is packed right in the middle of the Lord speaking to Moses and explaining to him how the people of Israel are going to be blessed, how their name is going to be called by the Lord, and how the things in the future are going to come from the nation of Israel. He's going to say that the Lord is going to put his name upon the people of Israel. He will bless them. Same promise that was given to Abraham, and what we see is that through God's blessing, through God's name being upon the people, through God's plan coming to fruition, the outcome, the result, the product of God's plan is peace. The Lord's blessing, the Lord's provision, the Lord's presence, his countenance leads to peace, and it's perfect peace, right? Because it comes from God who is perfect, who is holy, who is righteous. There is none like him. Would you celebrate that this year? Peace is not dependent upon circumstances, not dependent upon what you have or don't have. It's dependent upon one thing, and that is that you've received the blessing of the Lord because the Messiah 
has come. Peace is perfect. Number three, peace is a person. Now, obviously, we know it's a concept. It's something to celebrate, but it's, it's a person. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is peace. As he came as the Messiah, as he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with man, as he taught and ministered and ultimately laid down his life upon the cross, we know that there's this moment where he explains what peace really is. The moment came just before Jesus died, and it came after this encounter with his followers, his disciples. In John 14, beginning in verse 1, his disciples are worried. They're concerned. They're afraid. They're distraught because Jesus says, I'm leaving. I have to go. I have to go. This is the Father's will. And the disciples cried out and said, well, what do you mean you're going? Where are you going? Why can't we go? What's going to happen? Peter even says, wherever you go, I want to go. And Jesus says, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you can afterward. And here's what he said after that little encounter. In verse, um, pick up in verse 27 of John 14. Jesus said, whoever, uh, this is John 14, verse 27, excuse me. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You see, Jesus was about to die. In human terms, we would say that means it's about over. The curtain is closing, right? The sun is setting. Whatever other terms we want to, we want to use to say that this chapter is, is ending, but not with Jesus, right? Because Jesus is the miraculous son of God. And so as he says that he leaves his peace and he says, you will go with me one day. And he says, I will return, right? And where I'm going, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And, and so as we take that in, we say, because Jesus is about to die, it doesn't mean that things are ending. In fact, if anything, it's just a glorious milestone, a preparation for what is to come. But ultimately we see that Jesus in his power is able to offer peace Because he is the Son of God, he surpasses death. He has victory over all things. And so peace is actually in the person of Jesus Christ. This is why we celebrate Advent. Because when Jesus came, he brought peace. When he left, he left peace. When he rose again, he brought peace. And when he returns, peace will be fully seen, fully displayed, fully known. Peace is a person. But finally this morning, what we need to understand is that peace is practical. It's a wonderful concept. It's a wonderful idea. It's a wonderful theory and theological concept to study, but that's not all that it is. It would not fully be all that Christ came to do if it were just a concept to study about on a Sunday morning. No, peace is a practical concept for everyday life for believers. And so the question is, do you know peace? Let's go to Mark chapter 4. I love the story in Mark 4, verses 37 through 39, because I believe it's one of the most visual places where we can see peace. Tell you what's going on here. Jesus has been teaching. He gets in the boat with his disciples to go across the lake, and a a violent storm comes up, and his disciples are convinced they're going to die. They're going to drown. They're panicking. I mean, they are just convinced that this is the end. And here's what happens, picking up in verse uh, 37 of Mark chapter 4. It says, A great windstorm arose. The waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, speaking of Jesus, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Man, that's a powerful picture. We get in the boat often. We're in the middle of a storm. We're in the middle of difficult circumstances. We're convinced we're drowning. We're panicking. We're looking to every other place we can find to possibly solve the problem. The whole time, Jesus is asleep. Not asleep in meaning that he doesn't care. Not asleep in meaning that he's absent or he's not aware. But asleep in meaning that he is at total peace. Because he can calm the storm. He can speak and the storm will stop. And so what we see today is that that's the same illustration that we face all day long. Jesus is asleep. Simply mean he's completely at peace, at rest. All things are under his control, and everything is calm and collected and, and, and 
organized and it's under control. And so today, would we rest in that fact, no matter what's going on, we, we panic about things, we try to take matters into our own hands, but would the, the image in our mind ever be just the, this idea of in the middle of the storm, Jesus is just at complete peace, complete rest, and as the disciples wake him, he says, peace, be still, and the storm stop. That's why we celebrate peace at Advent, because Jesus came, we can know peace, no matter what the storm is, no matter what the circumstances are, peace is practical. Peace is to be lived out. It's to be experienced. It's to be cherished. It's to be displayed. My prayer today for you, for me, for our church, for this world, is that we would experience the true peace that comes about because God is with us. Emmanuel, the Lord our Savior, has come. He has fulfilled the promises that were made. He has brought about the things that we cherish, the love, the hope, the joy, the peace, the eternal security, the salvation, all the things that are promised, and even the things that are yet to come that have been promised. Today, they all center around this idea of being completely at peace in the boat with Christ. Whether there's a storm or whether it's a calm day, we have peace when we know the Lord. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you today for this time just to come and see what you've said about peace. We know, God, that peace is miraculous. It's extraordinary. All because you're divine and powerful and all ever-loving and, and because you've brought about peace by your plan. It's not man's plan, it's yours. We know that peace is perfect, Father, because it's from you who is perfect. We know that peace came in Jesus, in the flesh. We know that he promised to leave his peace for us. And God, we know that peace is practical, that we can live it out every day, every moment, every situation. We can bask in your peace. And so that's my prayer, God, that we would know your peace in a powerful way, in a personal way, in a life-altering way. We would walk in peace, specifically this Christmas season, specifically in the midst of uncertain circumstances. But God, even more than that, that ultimately, eternally, we would walk in your peace because of who you are and what you've done. Thank you for bringing that about. Pray for everyone who's been a part of this service. I pray for those who are ill, who are hurting, who are in the middle of a storm. God, would you be their source of peace? Lord, I pray for those who are sailing in, in calm waters. Things are going well. Lord, would you be their source of peace? Remind them that there's, their peace doesn't come because things are going well. Their peace comes because they know you, the author of peace. Lord, we pray you bring that about in every heart and every life. We love you, we thank you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There is no other so sure and steady. My hope is held in your hand. When castles crumble and breath is fleeting, upon this rock I will stand. Upon this rock I will stand. Glory, glory, we have no other king but Jesus, Lord of all. the anthem and our loudest praises ring we crown him Lord of all your kindly Shattered and broken, the curse of sin's tyranny. My life is hidden neath heaven's shadow. Your crimson flood covers me. Your crimson flood covers. Lord of all, oh, we raise the anthem, and our loudest praises ring, we crown him Lord of all, 
In all my sorrows, Jesus is better. Make my heart believe. In every victory, Jesus is better. Make my heart believe. Then any comfort, Jesus is better. Make my heart believe. More than all riches, Jesus is better. Make my heart our song eternal Jesus is better make my heart believe glory glory we have no other king but Jesus Lord of all glory glory no other king but Jesus Lord of all. Oh, we raise the anthem and our loudest praises ring. We crown him Lord of all. Glory, glory, we have no other king but Jesus. Jesus, Lord of all, oh, we raise the anthem, and our loudest praises ring, we crown him Lord of all, oh, we raise the anthem, and our loudest praises ring, we crown him Lord Crown him Lord of all. Well, friends, thank you once again for joining us today. We're delighted to know that we've been able to share this time with you, even remotely. Um, my prayer is that uh, you're well. And if you're not well, my prayer is that the Lord is providing in the midst of your struggle, that the Lord is providing healing, that he's providing peace. But today I want to close with a passage of Scripture, 2 Thessalonians 3.16. It's the prayer that Paul prayed for the church at Thessalonica as he was closing out his letter. It's my prayer for you. Uh, this 2 Thessalonians 3.16, Paul said, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way the Lord be with you all. Friends, that's my prayer for you today. My prayer is that you have peace this week. We're thankful for this opportunity. We look forward to Wednesday night, this Wednesday at 6 p.m. We're going to come with another live stream. It's going to be a special time. It's going to be a Christmas service. It's going to be a time to participate in the Lord's Supper together. It's going to be a time just to uh, have some worship and scripture reading. Ultimately, it's going to be a time just to celebrate the fact that Christ has come. If you need something this week, please let us know. If you have a need, if you have a, a, something we can, a way we can serve you in some way, would you please let us know. We'll be back next Sunday with another live stream at 10.30 a.m. And then we hope to be back in person January 3rd on Sunday morning. That's our plan. Uh, but we'll keep you posted. We love you guys, and we hope you have a wonderful week.